Connected Pit and welcome to Swangan. I'm your host, Dennis Allen. The Inivialuit have a fascinating history. They are a distinct people who lived along the Beaufort Sea coast. Archaeologist Dr. David Morrison spent many years studying the Inivialuit. Many of you know him or have worked with him. His knowledge is extensive. He wanted to share his work, so he produced an exhibit at the Canadian Museum of Civilization in Ottawa called Across Time and Tundra. Inivialuit filmmaker Sheila Pokiak, whose ancestry is well documented in the exhibit and whose mother appears in this episode, helped produce this story. Welcome to Swangan, our strength right here on APTN. I've always loved the Arctic. How did they describe in Uvialoit history and culture 100 years ago and 200 years ago? It just started to interest me more and more on its own, for its own merits. It's really interesting. It's fascinating, a lot of it is tragic. a lot of bad things happen, but it's very dramatic. The history of the Inuit people is, is one of the you know, great and exciting stories. The last person who touched this, just try to imagine what they were like, what their life was like. Well, the, the exhibit really grew more out of my interest in, in the last 200 years or so in the, in the written down and oral history parts of Inuvialuit history rather than the archaeology. It's, it's hard to do exhibits on archaeology, frankly, that, that interests the public often. Archaeology is thought by a lot of people to be really romantic and, and interesting and fascinating and all of that, and it is, but it's a, it's a lot different from Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's hard to communicate what it's really like to the public often, because we're, we're really just digging through ancient garbage. And archaeologists gets really excited about it because they understand it, but you show it to most other people, they don't even know what they're looking at. It's hard to do an exhibit on archaeology. Uh, on the other hand, the Nuvialuit history is, is such obviously accessible, it's so gripping, it's such an interesting story, I thought this would be a much easier thing to do an exhibit on. So the, the guy who runs the exhibit at the museum came to me four or five years ago now and said, would you like to do an exhibit and what would you do it on? And I thought for about four seconds and said, Inuvialuit history. Here we see the Inuvialuit and their neighbors. Uh, the Gwich'in living immediately to the south of them. And I'm trying to make the point that the, their Inuit neighbors are separated from them by unoccupied territory. So the Inuvialuit were very, very well self-defined, you know. They had, it was, it was a, a community unto itself. You know, they've always been a people a little apart. You know, they've got neighbors and, and relatives, but they're, they're distinct. Yes. And uh, their closest neighbors, the, the, the neighbors they got along with best were the Inupiat, the North Alaskan people. They'd always had important cultural connections and people would move back and forth between the two areas. And then the Central Arctic people. I've always loved the Arctic. It's, it's an impossible place not to love. And I always loved coming up to the Arctic in the summer and just traveling around and camping and going hunting and having a good time. Um, if I wanted to get to the Arctic and do these kinds of things, which are very, very expensive if you're, uh, if you're just a tourist, they're prohibitively expensive. Archaeology seemed like the best way. I was, I don't know, I've always been interested in archaeology too. Uh, if you're going to do archaeology in the Arctic, um, Inuit, the history of the Inuit people is, is one of the you know, great and exciting stories uh, to tell. It's fun to excavate, to, 
you know, to dig up ancient things and ancient ruins and, you know, be the first person to hold in your hand something that, you know, has been in the ground, for, you know, the last person who touched this. Just try to imagine what they were like and what their life was like. Um, it just seemed like such an interesting thing to do. This is my grandmother and her mother. Mama Yauk and her mother. She never, they never did tell us what her name was, but my grandmother, Val Kikwak, her name is Mama Yauk. That's her and that's her mother. My grandmother and my great grandmother. This is a drawing. Uh, a self-portrait uh, by, uh, by an Anuvia woman named Mamayok, Mama Mama uh, who we see other pictures of later. She worked with Stephenson, the explorer Stephenson, and she drew this picture of herself in his notebook. And that's a photograph of the, of the notebook. It's not the real thing. My grandparents are Edward and Violet Kikwak, and then my mother, uh, Lena, uh, she married my father, Bertram Pokiak. I was the fourth, fourth child of my parents. And uh, my name is uh, Nakuyuak. Uh, that was given to me by my grandmother, uh, Violet. Her name is Mamayauk. And she, because of my personality, she, uh, she named me uh, Nakuyuak, and that's my grandmother's name, my father's mother's name. My son works in the government, so he doesn't want to move up there. Mm -hmm. He's not used to it. And Marilyn works in the government, so she, she, she's, she's going to work there until she gets a pension, I guess. But me, I need to go up there and live on fish and meat, cable meat and muktuk. Swangan, our strength. We'll be right back here on APTN. Welcome back to Swangan, our strength, right here on APTN. Here we have a drawing, an Anuvi Alouette drawing uh, from the 1860s uh, of, a, of a hunting big whales, bowhead whales, like the Shingle Point whale, uh, from an umiak. And you can see the guy in the bow of the umiak has a great big long harpoon that he's sticking in the whale. It's not quite there yet. And for some reason, the whale's drawn quite small, and <laughs> half of it is off the frame. And here's sort of a modern drawing showing what it, what it might have looked like. This is the kind of boat they'd hunt big whales from, uh, an umiak. Uh, this is a model, uh, again collected in the 1860s by this guy McFarlane, who probably came and said, look, I can't, I, I don't want a whole umiak, I can't take it home. He had to go home by canoe to Montreal, you know, through the whole continent. Uh, so make me a model, and that's what they did. The first uh, Europeans to meet the Inuvialuit uh, at all closely, anyway, were the uh, second Franklin, you know, Sir John Franklin, the guy who went missing 30 years later, in uh, 1826, came into the Western Arctic. And uh, he was trying to do a Northwest Passage thing. Uh, we spent all our winters in Banks Island, and I remember life as it was, and um, hunting and trapping. No government, no welfare, everybody made a living off the land. In 1974, we worked uh, in Kiwaitan, in what is now Nunavut, west of Hudson Bay, at a place called Grant Lake. So, yeah, that was the first place. Grant Lake, just north of Dubont Lake, uh, where we were digging a very, very old site, so four or 5,000 years old, uh, parts of it. And uh, had a wonderful time. Uh, the fellow who, whose dig it was, the guy who organized it, put it together, still uh, works on this hall. Uh, I still see him every day, uh, Brian Gordon. And, uh, it, it was a great introduction to, uh, to life in the north and caribou and grizzly bears and all that exciting stuff. Exciting. 
the whale is put it into big barrels and uh, over time I, it gets liquid and then when you put the muktuk and the dried meat in it you have to turn uh, the uncooked muktuk you have to go in there five times a day to take it from the bottom to the top with your arm like this you have to put everything from the bottom on top you have to rotate it five times a day. Did you have, did, but growing up, did, were any of these? No, kinds we of never, tools? we stopped using that. Yeah. And we wouldn't make this, we'd trade for it from the Eastern Arctic. Because yeah. we didn't have any stones like that. In doing archaeology in the Nuvi Alawit area, I, I came face to face with the Nuvi Alawit, more recent Nuvi Alawit history, in, in two ways. One of which is the people who are there now, and you're just talking to people about what their what their grandfather's life was like, and so on. But the other way is is through deliberate study, because in order to make sense out of what was happening in the period before Europeans showed up, you have to know what was happening in the 19th century when Europeans did show up. What what, what did people write about? You know. What did, what, how did they describe Inuvi Alouette history and culture 100 years ago and 200 years ago? So I got more and more interested in, in the written documentary or oral history parts of, of Inuvi Alouette culture as well as the archaeology. Partially to make sense out of the archaeology, but it just started to interest me more and more on its own for its own merits. And the 19th century and the early 20th century in, in the Western Arctic is, is a time of enormous uh, things were happening. Uh, it, it's really interesting. It, it's fascinating. A lot of it is tragic. It, there's a lot of bad things happen, but it's very dramatic. It's 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 a wonderful history. And the more I got into it, the more I uh, more I wanted to study it. Let's go directly to the trading post and get it for a little cheaper. In 1861, they opened another post here at Fort Anderson, on the Anderson River, and that's where this stuff all comes from. Fort Anderson, the last great shaman. He could do all kinds of amazing things, one of which he could turn himself into a falcon. He's famous for being able to turn himself into a falcon. And one of the stories that people still tell, uh, he was arrested by the police. The cops show up on Herschel Island in 1904 to keep an eye on the American whalers and to make sure that Canadian law and Canadian sovereignty are upheld. And the police arrested Cublo Alec for something or other, conceivably public drunkenness, because that was the major uh, reason people got arrested back then. But whatever they did, they threw him in jail. And they, this is the jail here. This is the police, this is Herschel Island in 1909. Uh, so b about the same time, I guess. And that's the cop shop. That's where the jail was. And they, they lock him in his cell, and everybody goes home. He's alone in the building. There's a fire in the, in the stove. Kablo Alec waits until the fire in the stove goes out. And then he turns himself, not into a falcon, but into a falcon's feather. There's still an updraft up the, up the uh, chimney hole, but there's no fire. And he floats up the chimney hole, up the chimney, floats up that chimney there, comes down to the ground, turns himself back into himself, and walks home and goes to bed. <laughs> <laughs> the police come the next morning. There's no signs of a breakout. There's no signs of violence, but he's not there. They go to his house. There he is, you know, waking up. They arrest him, bring him back, put him in jail. He does the same thing that night. Floats up the hole, goes back home. The police arrest him again. This goes on for a, a couple more times, and finally they just give up. And they said, okay, and they made him a special constable. They actually hired him after that. When I was going to the Winnipeg General Hospital School of Nursing, I said it was different because it was a, a hospital run by Protestant women and men, and they, uh, they were just like the nuns, except they were Protestant. And they were very nice. But when we lived in Herschel Island, around there, our people used to be there. On the western side of the Mackenzie River, we lived there. There's walrus, there's seal, there's polar bear, there's caribou from uh, uh, Richardson Mountains along the Yukon. And we had... Uh, I guess the barren ground grizzly, we had all kinds of fish and uh, all the birds that came in the springtime. 
Uh, we used to live there, and we, we weren't called any value at that time before the flu epidemic. Uh, we called ourselves, and we lived uh, with all these clothing, mm -hmm. and we lived in caribou tents in the summertime. And in, in the wintertime, we had sod houses that sort of like on the ground there, you sort of dig, and then you put lumber. Oh, dr there's driftwood along there from the trees that go on the uh, uh, Arctic Ocean. There's from the Mackenzie River, all the trees that fell down all the way from Fort Smith and all the way down. It arrives there and uh, it washes up on so on. You, do, you pick them up and you haul them and you uh, make the floor of it and you make the walls with that and then you make a door and you live in there. And uh, we call ourselves the uh, Sigalix. Uh, our original name for ourselves was the Sigalix and it means saltwater people. I like the so. Uh, parkas, any size, anything like that. I have my machine at my house. It used to be here, but it's not. So I get separated from my sewing machine, and I feel really badly about it. In Uvialo, it seamstresses were among the best sewers in the world. They did fabulous clothes. This is made out of reindeer skin, which is why it's uh, spotted. This was l made long before the uh, reindeer herd arrived in, in the Delta. That didn't happen till 1920s. But uh, they were trading reindeer skin from Siberia, you know, all the way through Alaska because they like, you know, the look. They like the spotted look. And so this would be a, a comparatively fancy, expensive coat. And you can see a photograph here of a woman wearing a coat like that. And, and the, the woman is, is our friend uh, Mamiok. Swangan, our strength. We'll be right back here on APTN. Welcome back to Swangan, our strength, right here on APTN. These three plaques here are, are drawings made by the Anubi Alouette, collected in 1864-1865 at Fort Anderson. And they show the very first contact. I mean, this is, this is the Anubi Alouette view of white people from 1860s. You got three white guys sitting around a table. Uh, the guy in the middle, probably the missionary, Emil Petito, because he's got his black shirt on. One of the other two guys is probably McFarlane. Uh, Next panel is even more interesting, is a European man with a pipe and a beard. The woman standing beside him is definitely a native woman. I think she's probably not an Uvialo, and I expect she's uh, probably hair Satudene ancestor or, or Gwich'in. Uh, but I mean, they're obviously living together. Uh, it's a nice picture. They, there's, you know, he's got his hand on her hip and she's gesturing toward his face. You get the impression they like each other, which is, you know, important. And there's the little puppy dog there, and you know, the, an Inuvialo drawing of the inside of a European room in the 1860s. And then the third one is an Inuvialo drawing of an Inuvialo winter village with snow houses and the fox skins, because they're already trading skins to the Hudson's Bay Company. So the fox skins are up drawing, and you can see red skins and cross foxes, and red foxes. Two men in front, and if you look closely, the two men are fighting with knives. This little display is to try to teach people what a difference getting European iron and steel made to the toolkit. The Inuvialo still made their own stuff, but all of a sudden they could substitute steel and iron for you know, softer and less, less useful things. So you got an arrow, uh, the kind of jigging hook you use for you know, jigging for whitefish or whatnot. Do you jig for whitefish? No, you don't. Uh, bourbon. There's a hook with a bone, a bone hook, and here's one here with a steel hook. Then you got these kind of knives. These are knives used for cutting up antler and, and bone uh, with a little tiny blade. Mm -hmm. In the old days, this one, and this is archaeological, I dug it up myself, oh. the, the bit is a fox tooth. I noticed that actually. Yeah, it's a fox yeah. tooth. And here's the same Amazing. thing with a steel blade. This is a special kind of knife designed to be really strong but with a little tiny blade. So it's got a handle in two parts that are, are tied together around the blade. 
then a harpoon head uh, with a bone blade and with a steel blade, kind of dagger. And there's a, these guys carrying daggers with them most of the time up their sleeve. Uh, and there's a dagger made out of uh, bare bone. And then uh, here's the kind that they, they later make with steel. And these big spiral end handles. The Gwich'in use not, had knives just like these too. Uh, and an ulu. There's a, a kind of ulu with an antler handle and a stone blade. And a, a, a beautiful ulu with a big steel blade and an ivory handle. The Inuvial learned to smoke from the Alaskan Inuit, okay. from the Inupiat. And they got their first tobacco from there. And they made their pipes in the Alaskan and Inupiat style. Well, the Alaskans, Inupiat learned to smoke from, the, from Siberian Eskimos and from Chukchi in Siberia. And they learned to make their pipes from the same style. Ultimately, these are, these are Chinese opium pipes. The style goes all the way back to Chinese opium pipes. That's, that's the shape. But they're making their own pipes themselves. And you see the bowls are made out of, of, uh, of, bra of uh, um, lead and copper. Okay. And the, the, the copper is shot. Uh, or, or copper? Yeah, copper. What, what, what do you shoot? What's a lead? No, that's a lead ball. Copper is from pots. That's right. The copper, they're cutting up trade pots, which are made out of copper. And they're getting lead shot from gunshot. And they're melting it and casting things. And they're casting their own pipe bowls with two different metals, one inlaid in the other. And this is no more than 10 years, 12 years after they first started trading with the Hudson's Bay Company. And in, in 10 or 12 years, they've learned how to do this. At the museum here, we had a, a team. There's a, what we call a core team. So there's me as the curator and the sort of expert. Then there's an interpretive planner, and her name was Jennifer Elliott. Um, and Jennifer's job is to, is to do the interactives. It's, it, Jennifer's job really is, is to help make the information more accessible to the public and more interesting to the public. So she does the interactives, the parts of the, the exhibition that, that people can actually touch and feel and do things. So the, the dance studio was her idea, for instance, where you can go in and do an Inuvialuit drum dance. Now when I go up north, I don't get out of the communities. It's nice to be in the communities, but it's even nicer to be out on the land and for weeks or months at a time instead of just for a couple of days. So I still manage to go to the Western Arctic once or twice a year, but I don't get out on the land anymore. I don't get to, you know, eat dry meat and hang around. Uh, and I do really miss that. And I haven't given up hope of doing it again. Well, that was our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or concerns about our programming or would like a copy of one of our shows, call us at 867-777-2320 or email at swangan at permafrost.com. Tune in again next week as we bring you highlights from the fifth season of Swangan. Until then, I'm your host, Dennis Allen. Kui I've been asked to live there in 1991 after our mother died. He wanted an elder, like one of the aunts, to live there. I said, why do you want me to live there? He says, we need an elder now. We need somebody for our children and grandchildren to help out. And I said, but I have grandchildren in Ottawa. They need my help. So I have to, until they're all grown, then I can live up there. <laughs>